It is now midnight, April 26, 1986. The fifth shift has taken control of Chernobyl Unit 4, and in 84 minutes, the reactor that they are operating will be destroyed. The decisions they make, unbeknownst to them, will determine the fate of the reactor. Now, let's break down the first hour of the night shift. To recap the situation that we ended with at the end of April 25th, we have a 10 hour delay to the turbine rundown experiment. Delayed vibration measurements on the same turbine required for the rundown experiment. Operators that have not performed this experiment before. Xenon poisoning that had largely reversed itself following the power reduction on the morning of April 25th. A number of other experiments scheduled to be carried out on the reactor. What we're about to follow is what I believe to be the most accurate depiction of the events leading to the Chernobyl disaster. Almost immediately, we are about to encounter the first controversial moment in the reactor's fate. When the shift change occurred, reactor power was at 760 megawatts of thermal output. By five minutes past midnight, the power had already dropped to 720 megawatts and was continuing to decline. Consulting the guide for the rundown procedures, we can see that the program demands a power of between 700 and 1000 megawatts. So, why are they continuing to drop? A few reasons have been put forward for this, including Toptonov being unable to keep up with the drop in power during the complicated handover, or general xenon poisoning. But the actual answer seems to be that it was deliberate. At five minutes past midnight, a command by the order of Akimov is written in the operating log. Begin a power reduction. Again, reasons for why such a power reduction would be initiated are seemingly limitless. Yuri Tregub reported at the trial that he saw Dyatlov demanding Akimov perform this power reduction, to which Akimov protested, although it is worth noting that Tregub was only reading lips at the time. Dyatlov himself also accused Boris Rogozhkin, the chief shift supervisor for all units, of having an argument with Akimov resulting in the power drop. The All Union Research Institute for Nuclear Power Plants Operation, VNIIAES, produced their own report into the accident based on the testimony from the operators in Moscow Hospital No. 6. In their eyes, the power drop was associated in mitigating the consequences of a pressure wave in the drum separators when the rundown began. They then asserted this was the correct decision. What is corroborated in most witness testimony is Dyatlov demanding that Toptonov hurry up and complete the reduction in power. At this point in time, Toptonov is being observed not only by both superiors, Akimov and Dyatlov, but also the shift supervisor from the preceding shift, Yuri Tregov, as well as Viktor Proskuryakov and Alexander Kudryavstev, two trainee senior reactor control engineers expected to take up positions in Unit 5 at the end of the year. Even some people on shift in Unit 4 had decided to skip their posts for the time being to observe, such as Mikhail Elshin. Others had remained from the previous shift, such as Sergei Gazin. However, Toptonov's job was made more complicated than normal. Ordinarily, during these power reductions, such as on April the 25th, a representative of the Nuclear Physics Laboratory would be present, using a computer program to help lower the power while ensuring the operating reactivity margin the equivalent number of control rods inserted into the core, did not fall to low levels due to xenon buildup. Unfortunately for Toptonov, the specialist supposed to be on shift that day, Anatoly Chernyshev, was absent as he had mistakenly been told that the reactor was already shut down. This means that Toptonov was effectively lowering the power without being able to see the ORM. Here again, we have another point of controversy. According to many people at the trial, Dyatlov was present in the control room for the entirety of the shift, but he himself, and a few others outside the trial, 
maintained that he was absent from time to time. Given that many of those at the trial were threatened and coerced into a stance negative towards Dyatlov, we will be following a version of events with a small detail. Dyatlov actually leaves the control room to observe several areas that will need maintenance before shutdown. Regardless of if you believe it or not, Dyatlov will not play a significant role in the upcoming events. With Dyatlov out of the room and pressure lifted from the back of Toptonov, he continues to lower the power under less supervision. And down it goes. Meanwhile, people watch the other desks to observe their progress as the reactor approaches a crucial stage. Here, as power approaches 500 megawatts, when Toptonov disengages the local automatic control, an issue inside the reactor occurs, which I will try to make as simple as possible. There are three groups of automatic control rods inside the reactor, used to keep power stable by withdrawing or inserting if power gets too low or too high respectively. The first of these comes online and detects the reactivity in the core is lower than the power level the automatic control rod is set to. This causes all four control rods in the group to fully withdraw. Then the second group of control rods comes online and this time the imbalance in the core is so extreme they cannot move at all. And the third group, which acts as a reserve, doesn't come online either. So now there are no automatic regulators working in the core. At this point, 28 minutes past midnight, something that is still not definitively explained occurs in the core, causing a dramatic decrease in the power output. It is generally accepted that the accumulation of xenon, not from the events of April 25th, which had almost fully cleared at this point, but from this power drop from 1600 megawatts, performed in the absence of computer guidance, played some role. However, it is also well established that this would not be enough to cause such a rapid drop in power. Perhaps the most likely explanation is a little forgotten quirk in the RBMK. So-called self-propelled rods were control rods that would spontaneously insert or withdraw themselves at full speed no less, into or out of the reactor. Soviet scientists were of course aware of this and had created multiple fail-safes for control rod retraction, but there was very little, if anything, for control rod insertion. A very rapid collapse in power occurred, as Toptonov could only watch as multiple emergency signals came up on the panel in front of him and emergency protection systems being put on standby. Power quickly fell so low that the automatic regulators could not be put back online, and Toptonov began a very quick adjustment of the automatic power regulators to try to bring the set points in line with the new reactor output, so automatic regulator 1 would begin to work again, and then the other groups would no longer be jammed and unable to move. By the time this was done, it was already too late. Reactor power had fallen so low that the neutron count had fallen below range, close to zero. Many people have asserted the number 30 megawatts appears here, although this has never been definitively proven. And now, Toptonov, Akimov and Tregub are left with what would initially appear to be a tough decision on what to do next. Some people would assume that you would simply have to abandon the experiment at this point, due to the xenon pit that they were close to falling into. But as Tregub knew, with the most experience controlling the reactor under his belt, if they were quick enough to remedy the situation, then they could raise the power back up. And if the control rods remained at safe levels, then everything would be fine. The previously mentioned All Union Research Institute for Nuclear Power Plant Operation would also assess raising the power here as the correct decision. Some witnesses seem to suggest that Toptonov, however, had doubts about raising the power and didn't want to do it. The reason why is quite simple and what we mentioned just a few seconds ago, the Xenon Pit. Apparently aware of his lack of experience, he didn't want to raise the power, at least not alone. So, Tregub swapped places with Akimov 
so he was stood in front of the selector panel, and with the help of Toptonov, the two of them began to select rods to pull out of the reactor. Toptonov's lack of experience quickly came on show, as at times he began to pull control rods unevenly, and Tregub had to point out which rods to move. And very slowly, the level of reactivity began to climb, back into a level where it could be recorded, and up. Meanwhile, problems were still unfolding at every other panel due to the power drop. For Stolyachuk, the drop in power had caused a huge fall in steam flow out of the reactor. This was now causing the pressure in the steam separators, where steam from the reactor flowed towards, to fall, as well as the level of water contained within. To prevent an automatic shutdown, he quickly lowered the minimum pressure and waited for Toptonov to regain control. And at the turbine desk, Kirschenbaum was now having to watch as the steam supply towards Turbine 8 plummeted, which he could do absolutely nothing about. And then both the turbine rundown and the vibration experiments would be doomed. Razim Davletbaev, the deputy head of the turbine workshop for operation, had to step in to make sure that the turbine didn't shut down, and run him through a checklist of last minute steps to take to do so. And then, Dyatlov walks back into the room, quite aware that something has gone wrong, from the fact that there are now 5 people trying to raise the reactor power, which is stuck at around 50 megawatts right now. Akimov quickly hurried over, and explained that reactor power had fallen to 30 megawatts, and they were now trying to raise it. Dyatlov, for his part, didn't seem to care much for this, according to all available witness testimony. There were no raised voices, and when Akimov told him that they wanted to raise the power to just 200 megawatts, Dyatlov agreed to it. It is worth noting that this lower power level doesn't affect the test in any way, as the experiment is based on the time it takes for the turbine to spin down, which doesn't change at different power levels. Meanwhile, now at 41 minutes past midnight, turbine number 8 is disconnected from the reactor at last. Run down to idle for one of the vibration experiments, and would not be reconnected to the reactor for another 35 minutes. Soon after, they managed to reach 160 megawatts, or 5% of reactor thermal output, and switch on the automatic regulators again. Now reactor power was climbing at a comfortable rate again, too fast at some points as more water boiled in the core and the positive void coefficient made itself felt. This would lead to automatic regulators being inserted again to compensate. But there was more trouble to come for the operators trying to balance all of these issues. In order to prime the computer system, Scala, to record fresh values from the rundown, the DREG program, which recorded reactor parameters, was turned off and on repeatedly as new magnetic tape was inserted. With this turned off, the operators are temporarily controlling the reactor blind now in a number of ways. Already, they were without the nuclear physics laboratory and its reactor program. Now, for the next 20 minutes, said operators have to contend with being without up-to-date readings from the Prisma program on the Scala computer, which provide a guidance for the operators on how to operate the reactor. Their devices that calculated the operating reactivity margin would not work because the power was too low. And finally, they didn't know what the new distribution of xenon in the core looked like, which would have changed during the power drop 15 minutes earlier. Despite the fact that operators could only rely on the side ionization chambers to estimate power, this mode of operating had never been limited or forbidden by the designers or engineers that created the RBMK. The operators did reportedly have some mechanism of drawing up a rough operating reactivity margin in the control room, using a slow data recording system that would bring the value up on a display, which Toptonov checked semi-regularly against hundreds of other data points to keep the reactor in balance. Tregub too looked and saw a number around 19, and slowly dropping down, but still clearly above the minimum limit. A lot of these inserted rods seem to be the automatic regulators 
counterbalancing the rising positive void coefficient. At approximately 1am, the power output reached 200 megawatts, and the job of the automatic regulators transitioned from helping to raise the power to keeping it as stable as possible around that number. As Tregub would say, he did not like those 200 megawatts, simply due to the low power, but he had to accept the command and move on. So, he went back over to Kirschenbaum and the turbine desk, to see what was going to unfold there during the experiment. And now, Toptonov was again alone at the controls. The atmosphere in the control room was calm and relaxed. The reactor power is stable, with a permissible number of control rods inserted into the reactor. 24 minutes remain until destruction. <laughs> 